presentation, Fiction as a Legal Weapon, the Eric Scott story of murder. <coughs> On 10 July 2010, my son Eric Scott was shot and killed by three Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department or Metro officers in front of a Costco store in Las Vegas, Nevada. He was a 1994 graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, same school as Antonio went to. He had an MBA from Duke University, <coughs> and he was a highly successful businessman. At the time of his death, he was working as a cardiac pacemaker sales rep for Boston Scientific. Eric was carrying a legally registered concealed firearm while he and his girlfriend were shopping at Costco. He had a concealed carry permit, legal, and uh, uh, most pacemaker reps nowadays do routinely carry a weapon, especially there in Las Vegas, because they often have to go into rough areas any time of the day or night to service uh, patients. And they also run around with about $30,000 worth of electronics equipment, and that's why they carry it. So when Eric squatted on the floor to verify the three metal water, water bottles <coughs> fit into a soft-sided zip-up cooler, the Costco employee saw the weapon uh, that he was carrying inside the waistband his jeans. I always said if Eric had a three inch longer t-shirt on he'd be alive today but he became uncovered and this uh, employee reporter the manager came civil interchange ensued and the employee informed Eric of Costco's policy that guns were not allowed inside company stores. However there were no signs outside posted uh, near the entrance or inside the store and the gun ban policy is not mentioned on the uh, membership application which Eric had just filled out. Eric calmly responded that his firearm was legal and that he had a concealed carry weapon permit on his person. Nobody ever asked Eric to leave. But for reasons known only to him, a young plainclothes security guard subsequently placed a call to the police and claimed Eric was actually <coughs> erratic and was carrying a gun. For the record, Eric was not acting erratic. We have found out that this gentleman was. He was in the store just before Eric was, and I don't reveal his name or anything because we may have to use it, but he looked so much like Eric, they could have been brothers. Same height, same weight, similar colored hair, and he did cause a disturbance back at the uh, pharmacy just before that. So it kind of all came together as, hey, the guy that caused the problem back there is uh, now in the store carrying a gun. And we have a 911 call, and this guy ratcheted it up. The dispatcher cranked it up. So when the cops rolled in, they really thought they were dealing with a hostage situation. They said, evacuate the store. It was announced, but nobody uh, told the, uh, the customers why they were being evacuated. So, <coughs> Eric and his girlfriend calmly walked out with the rest of the crowd. As they went outside, they passed three Metro officers waiting at the entrance, guns drawn. Costco undercover security guard identified Eric and Metro officer William Mosier started yelling. Eric turned 180 degrees to find three cops looking at him and this fat, sweaty, very scared cop shouting three conflicting commands <coughs> his left hand, Eric had the, had the situational awareness to lift his t-shirt to expose the pistol and repeated, I am armed, I am armed. But he had his Blackberry cell phone in his right hand. Mosier panicked and fired two rapid shots. First round struck Eric in the heart. Two other cops who had no idea what was going on fired another five rounds. Eric was shot a total of seven times. Five bullets hit him in the back and were fired after he was on the ground and dying. Based on a 911 call recording, so we know this, this is a, how long it took, Mosier had screamed three different commands, then fired within approximately two, two seconds. Mosier then knelt on Eric's back and cuffed my son's hands. Eric was already dead. Costco had numerous security cameras inside the store, and at least four trained on the entrance where the shooting took place. Violating
violating company policy, or excuse me, department policies, Metro detectives did not immediately seize the surveillance system's digital video recorder hard disk. They left the DVR and hard drive in Costco's control for five days, and Costco personnel were allowed to mess with that video in that time. Later, 4% of the video data were ultimately deemed, quote, unrecoverable. The lost data just happened to cover the time that Eric was in the store for being murdered at the entrance. Within a few hours of the shooting, a Clark County deputy, a public administrator, and a Metro cop broke into Eric's condo and stole several firearms, including two pistols. One firearm was later claimed to be proof that Eric was carrying a second gun. Why? So the one and only gun that he was carrying legally and was still in his waistband as they put the body in the ambulance. We have that from numerous witnesses. So that particular gun could be removed from the body and put on the ground in front of Costco as, quote, proof that Eric had pulled it. Okay. Before the Metro homicide detectives got there, it took them almost 40 minutes to get there. I'll explain more about that later if you want. A subsequent quote-unquote investigation was a classic Las Vegas Metro cover-up that three killer cops and a very corrupt sheriff who was running for re-election. The cover-up involved the Clark County District Attorney, Public Administrator, the judicial system, and an extremely brutal, arrogant police union. It's what I call a cartel of corruption. Three years later, after Eric's murder, not a single person has ever been held accountable. So that brings us to fiction as a legal weapon. <clears throat> we filed two lawsuits, but for bizarre reasons, they went nowhere. The U.S. Department of Justice relied on Metro's so-called investigation and decided to not look into Eric's murder by cop. So how does a common citizen secure justice among a powerful cartel of casino owners, the Vegas Police Department that serves as a Cleveland mob's enforcers, and a corrupt legal system set up to ensure killer cops are always exonerated. Eric's coroner inquest in September of 2010 was on the order of about the 200 that had taken place over a series of decades. Not a single cop in 200 had ever been held, had ever been found at fault. Violates the laws of statistics. So how do you deal with that? Corrupt legal system, that guarantees the cops are always exonerated. Well, I chose to wage asymmetric war. The first strike of my guerrilla war was writing the permit. And that's a novel based on actual events. So you say, why fiction? One is personally cathartic. In fiction, I could whack bad guys and literally destroy the cartel of corruption that murdered my son, then assassinated his character. Two, I could expose the truth about Eric's execution and his cover-up. Couldn't do it in nonfiction at the time because we had legal stuff going on. Three, I could leverage the Earth's most powerful weapon for shaping perception and moving society in new directions, entertainment. By wrapping a riveting story around hard facts, I could awaken, I hope, millions of readers to the shocking truths such as America is besieged by an epidemic of police brutality. No need to tell you that. In the last two decades, cops have killed more Americans than died on 9-11-2001. A U.S. citizen is eight times more likely to be killed by a cop than an Islamic jihadist. And a cop is 130 times more likely to be involved in an act of misconduct than to be killed in the line of duty. So what's the permit about? Here's an overview. This is fiction. The Department of Homeland Security Intelligence <coughs> Team has identified a new, incredibly dangerous terrorist group codenamed Indigo. When three Indigo terrorists gunned down Eric Steele, a federal covert operations agent, <coughs> they incur the wrath of Checkmate, a highly classified off-the-books team of assassins that employs high-tech weapons to kill sleeper cell jihadists. Eric was one of those. Checkmate starts taking out the indigos who killed one of their agents. But the covert operatives 
are on a short fuse. If Checkmate fails to quickly neutralize Indigo, America will explode in armed revolt. Thousands of honorable officers and innocent citizens will die. The covert Checkmate team employs super classified weapons such as a disease called fatal familial insomnia. The infected targets can't sleep, their bodies literally burn out from exhaustion, and they die. It's a real disease, by the way. Call that that by. So now you have also, we also use unmanned drones that track and attack bad guys using advanced sea in the dark systems. The primary drone they use is called the Gremlin. And one of the things it does, it fires electronic signals that create a ghost that emulates Eric Steele. But it's only, it only appears in the brain of the guy with the right genetic code. You can code this stuff particularly bad cop, and it's the head of Metro Homicide, drives him insane. A system that can take control of a Cadillac, trigger a fatal crash, tiny missiles with a warhead made of nanoparticles, which literally liquefy human tissue. A robotic dog, most people like the dog, with a warhead made, uh, excuse me, that fires high power microwave beams to blind bad guys, or worse. An acoustic weapon that shatters human bone, pulverizing big box warehouse stores. Good. And then T-Rex, an electromagnetic pulse weapon that destroys microchips and other electrical devices, literally turning resort, hotel, casinos into dark caverns. And T-Rex is flown on a black world fighter aircraft called the A-17 Shadow. The bottom line is, the permit sounds five loud and clear messages. One, there's no escaping accountability and justice. Although these smug cartels of corruption all over the nation believe that they control every office and every public official, they can't escape the fury of angry citizens backed by shadow warriors. Two, corrupt public officials will be held accountable for their crimes in ways they cannot conceive, administered by forces they know nothing about, using weapons beyond their comprehension. In the permit, the warning that indigo domestic terrorists is unmistakable. You kill, you lie, you die. Number three, there's no escape for these killers who hide behind wealth, power, and a thin veil of corruption of corrupt officialdom. Four, the warriors of justice are already monitoring these heartless killers and are just waiting. Five, finally the permit is a memo to corrupt coward cops like Bill Mosier Tom Mendiola, Robert Snyder, Patrick Baborski, Patrick Neville, Brian Yamp, Derek Colling, and Jesus Arabello, just at the start. And this message is some forms of justice are worse than death. Sorts of, sorts of plea deals went from, and it was a, an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. I'll tell you what it was a crime. I sat in jail for 10 months and I wouldn't accept any plea deals. They went from 50 years to 40 years to 8 years to 4 years. And I would, I would not plead guilty for something I didn't want. And if I'd have done it, I'd have jumped all over a plea deal, but I just wouldn't do it. And this is in a county where they have a 98% conviction rate. I didn't really realize all that, or I probably wouldn't have stuck to this because hindsight. I'm glad I did now. But during this process, um, I couldn't bond out because all of the money I had was 
checks taken by this other person. My bank, I had checks forged, um, ATM card used. I mean, everything I had was taken from me. I lost cars, ve uh, vehicles, money, every tool I ever owned, clothes, everything. But thank God I had a public defender. When he came to see me, I, I told him, I said, if you don't believe me, I don't want you. And he says, well, I'll be back. He come back two days later and he looks at me and he says, I believe you and we're going to fight. And I asked him why. And he said, well, I talked to this other person and they lied to me. I said, well, why did they lie? What did they lie about? And he says, well, that part doesn't matter, but I know they're a liar. Fast forward, I went to trial, and that whole process in itself is just unbelievable. I won't bore you with a lot of details, but it goes to the point of where there's certain groups get involved, um, tried to take the jury. Um, they got, we caught wind of that, and my attorney put things in place that prevented it and stopped it. They actually tried it. In biggest thing for me was during the trial, we, I had four police officers get up and swear under oath that when they came into my bedroom that there was this weapon sitting on my chest drawer. And I knew it wasn't true. And my attorney allowed three of them to get up and say that. And the only thing he did to challenge them was this. He said, are you sure? And I'm sitting there, my head's about to explode. I'm like, Come on, man, you gotta tell them. You know, you gotta let this jury know. I'm, I mean, I'm looking at dying in prison for something I didn't do. But he was obviously brilliant, and I love lawyers. And I used to crack the jokes about, you know, there's lawyers are just catfish, you know, they, you know whatever. <laughs> the bad joke. But no longer. But he waited until the most corrupt cop that I've ever heard of in my life got on the stand. And I, unbeknownst to me, I did not know that during his dis our discovery, my lawyer found their audio, the police audio and video of this next guy who got on the stand, Sergeant Jorge Sanchez, got on the stand and said the same thing. Yes, I came into that bedroom and that knife was there. Then my attorney did something that, of course, was a Perry Mason moment, I called it. He says, well, I'd like to play this for you. Maybe this will help your memory. <laughs> he played his own words. Sergeant Jorge Sanchez giving an order to go get a knife out of my kitchen. It was never a knife. And bring it to my bedroom. They took a picture of it and came before this one girl. Now that isn't the only reason why I wasn't found, that I was found not guilty. I was completely exonerated by a jury of 12. Um, in fact, they had an opportunity to even convict me of just simple assault. And part of the jury instructions were if you can't, if Mr. Young has to prove that he was defending his six-month-old son from being harmed to be found not guilty of simple assault, and I was found not guilty of simple assault. So I was a naive sort of a fool. I, I go home and I, it's a, I'm just a mess. I'm going, how the heck am I going to get my life back together? I'm naive and dumb. I called the police chief of this town and said, hey, I just want to let you know. I thought he should know that he's got cops that are that dumb, first of all, and crooked to even have it on record. Well, I, you know, we don't, we don't accept that kind of behavior, so I'm going to have this internal affairs guy called. <laughs> I spent about two minutes on the phone with this guy, and I realized that it wasn't about holding his peers accountable. It was trying to find something to discredit me. And I terminated that conversation by telling him this. I said, just be ready. I'll come at you. I'll get you another one. And that's what I've been trying to do. I've, there is a, a federal lawsuit that's going forward very soon. Um, I have been very vocal online. They know I've got a very a Facebook page that's up this little rich town in north of Dallas. Since
since I put that up, I've had people call me or email me. Uh, for example, a lady, I'm not going to put her name out there, but she's a, a, a doctor in, this, in a neighboring town. Her 16-year-old son was driving through town, gets pulled over. She Googles the cop's name. Well, I got their names and badge numbers out on my website, right? So she calls or emails me and says, hey, what's up with this guy? And I'm like, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> This 16-year-old young guy, no record, was pulled over, pulled out of his car, frisked, his car searched, and he's asking, why did you pull me over? And on their recording, in this particular case, you didn't look right. Well, it just so happens, he looks like this guy right here, <laughs> the color of his skin, driving while black in Frisco, Texas. So I blast them on that. I keep it very... So they know who I am. They're mad at me. They wish I would shut up and go away, but I'm not. Because what happened to me, I made it through it. I'm happy. But I want my little, now he's two, two, two-year-old son. His dad's not the most perfect guy in the world, but I want him to know at least I tried to stand for something. So anyway, more to come on that story. Some of my background is that I have a degree in uh, criminal justice from St. Edward's University and, and also gerontology. And I have a, you know, got a state license. Uh, I, I was at the, uh, back in 91, I was at the airport at Robert Bueller at that time. And I went to pick up a lady friend of mine that was flying in. And as I was waiting for her, I was really renting a vehicle. Near the baggage area, I was approached by one guy. Uh, he was about, I'd say, about six eight and about three hundred pounds. Another guy was small. Uh, they kind of pinned me in, and they asked me, "How much money do you have on you?" Now I'm, I'm thinking that uh, you know, am I going to get robbed? But come to find out. Uh, one of them sold a badge, pulled a badge out from under his shirt. And I asked, what have I done? What's, what's the problem? Now, they didn't mention drugs or anything. And they said, uh, is it okay to search you? And I'm still wondering, these, these guys are going to rob me. And I had, I'm a little guy. Uh, so they asked to look at my briefcase. So they did they didn't pat me down. They wanted to look at my briefcase. Now, I, the reason I found out I was stopped was because I had expensive boots on. Now, I still have, they still haven't broke that habit. I still wear my boots. You know, I love cowboy <laughs> boots. And also, I had a pager and I had a briefcase. And I, I was dressed casual. Uh, so I, I complied, but inside, I had a feeling something is wrong here. It was a mixture of fear and disbelief. Uh, I've been privileged uh, to not have to deal with the police a lot. Uh, maybe I always lived on the other side of town or something. I, I wasn't a criminal uh, or whatever. I didn't run around with them, you know. And uh, I didn't drink and I didn't drug. So I get stopped as a drug person. Now, it was embarrassing. I, I complied. But I walked away with an empty feeling, and one of the baggage handlers said, man, you're about the, I believe it was eighth or ninth black they've stopped to date. Uh, oh yeah. And it really was sinking in what's going on. I was stopped because I was black, and I cannot wear boots. And I cannot have, I think, uh, you know, I can't, things I can't do. And I believe I have a phone now, so. Uh, so, I, I talked to, I thought about it. I know attorney friends. Uh, I went back, it bothered me so much. The feeling I had was when 
I was four or five years old, my dad was a builder in Wichita Park. We were building a ranch. And we had to go get something to eat at a store. And my dad would always go to the back. Now, this was in, what, 56, something like that, 57. Uh, we pull up front one time, and he told me, don't go in the front door of that store. You can't go into it. I went anyway. You know, I remember that because it, was, it changed my life. Uh, I went in and the guy treated me okay. I got the food and left. And, but it stayed in my mind. Why? And he, my dad kind of explained to me. But that's the feeling I had, a sinking feeling, after I found out they're stopping the lights out here. Uh, I went back the next day. I just wanted an apology. Uh, at least a, a communication that, you know, not in front of 300 people. If you're going to search me, you know, do your job or whatever, but not in front of the baggage or whatever. They were that. What did that guy do? <coughs> and uh, he's guilty because they are doing it. We don't care. I, I also reported it. I, I it was in a habit. I worked around a lot of all, most of my life. Uh, we don't care who you are, boy. Uh, what we're doing, we're going we're gonna to keep doing it. And I went there with a piece of talk, you know, just try to do a little bit more discreetly. And I still hadn't formulated in my mind that this was wrong. Uh, I ran into a friend of mine, Gary, uh, Gary Bledsoe, at the airport. I was out there, I believe the same day I asked for the apology. No, I was taking my girlfriend back to fly back out. And I kind of mentioned what happened. And he just said one day, he said, what are you going to do about it? And that's it. He was catching his flight. And that stayed in my mind. Uh, I had, uh, I was uh, a manager for a major builder uh, well, in the country. And I had a, a friend of mine. Uh, and he was a, a tenant. And I knew it was wrong, because I know the law. Uh, but uh, I had him dress up in my clothes, my boots, my jeans, my shirt, my pager, my briefcase. We had another guy filming all this. For four days, they did not look at him twice. And I made sure the same officers were on duty, and I stayed out of line. They didn't know this was going on. <laughs> uh, I got in contact with the Civil uh, Rights Project in Texas. We filed a lawsuit. It was the first uh, uh, pr profile. They said I fit the profile. Uh, we got a on deposition, we got to got found out what the profile is. It's walking too slow, walking too fast, looking around, not looking around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, dressed down, dressed up. It's just whatever. But it came down to uh, mostly minorities and a lot of Hispanics. But the deal was, they were getting money. Now, this is still on the law. They will take your money. You only have 20 days to get it back. Millions and millions of taken from these airports. They don't tell you you have 20 days. You have to file a lawsuit, get to an attorney to get your money back. I don't care if it's $20 or 10000 And a lot of the Hispanic men I found out will, will travel from uh, Chicago to go down to Houston. This is stopping off the place to buy plants to take back out there. They carry cash. They take the money. I started getting calls after it went public. My announcement was that uh, I'm pro law enforcement. I still am. There's some bad actors. I'm anti-drug, but I'm a citizen of the United States. And, you know, this is not going to work. Uh, we filed a lawsuit, and uh, I had credit cards, thank God. I really don't get out there. But uh, we filed a lawsuit. It was the first case on uh, court TV. And I, I lost that lawsuit, but I had 29 witnesses. It just so happened an attorney quickly moved to San Antonio, set up a nice practice. I uh, didn't declare my witnesses. You have to do it in 30 days. She did it in 29 days. 29 and a half days. <laughs> Another friend of mine uh, caught men in black in a police vehicle <coughs> breaking into my apartment. I had two kids. I was raising two of my nephews. Uh, after his deposition, uh, they flew him to Florida. I was been, I've been told I was the only person they know of in the United States that's had a restraining order against the police because within a half mile of my residence of where they know I am in plain clothes. Uh, it got that uh, tenuous because uh, I had kids there. They're breaking.
direction and not walking. And this is, I called the media. They came over first. Then I called the police and I had some weapons on uh, Because that's how serious it was. You couldn't break and not walk. I got kids. I'm going to protect them. Uh, so we did get a restraining order. Now, the, like I said, I lost that case, but to my surprise, no one had anyone, uh, that's why I like Peaceful Streets Project, no one had anyone to stand up. It takes a lot of God to face these people. They will, you have to be squeaky clean. You can't spit on the side. And that's the way your life is going to be for years and years. I worried about even dating because I didn't know. I was told by different officers that they didn't Seriously, they stepped back to make sure I didn't pick it up on the tape. Because they thought, <laughs> you know, they knew I carried tapes. Uh, now, but what happened there, it, it was something, you know, it changed my life. Like you said, I've got to fight for something. And at that moment, uh, you know, thank God, I had the integrity to be able to do something. And I was totally <coughs> thankful. I hadn't done anything. Uh, I couldn't find anything. As a matter of fact, uh, I represented the USA in USA Today, the 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights, a war on drugs run up, runs up against the Fourth Amendment. Ironically, they said uh, a drug and alcohol council, which I was, and licensed, bust, bust uh, narcotics. Yeah. But uh, what I found, now, this is during the period of Rodney Key. I, I became active, and I'm lucky to Sometimes it, it takes something, you know, to touch us. But see, this stuff, I can't imagine how much it goes on. And I was under, under the false assumption that it had, you know, stopped or slowed down or whatever. But to uh, Reggie informed me, you know, and I started looking around again. You know, I lived in my little safe world, don't make way. Well, I live in Abilene, Texas. If I did something there, uh, you know, you could find me on the bench post. I, I, I'm serious. I went on to investigate uh, uh, police shootings, uh, civil rights investigators, state lives. Uh, and I formed a, with the help of Gary Bledsoe, uh, the task force to identify innocent prisoners. And uh, believe it or not, T-Close, at that time, I'm not sure now, didn't have the funds to track down crooked cops. They could get fired. In this town, moving 30 minutes down the road, they have another job. And if for some reason they didn't want to do it, so they <coughs> solicited uh, myself and some friends to try to keep track of these people. And sure enough, they go just right <coughs> back to the same old habit. And uh, I found different patterns. Uh, somehow I uh, had a lot of integrity on uh, a lot of major cases, uh, most, most of them were homicides. Uh, Certain agencies could not hold the case unless they had my signature or proof. When, like in a small town, it could be rich. It didn't have to be black or white. Rich and poor, police. And uh, we were able to, uh, to get some of those guys fired. But uh, what, I guess the message I want to deliver, we as an individual can make a difference. And when I was doing it, it was dangerous. But I really thank God for the media. They protected me. Now, also, I would get calls from police uh, officers. They said, Wayne, I can't tell you my name, but we are on your side. White, black, Hispanic. They're on our side. So it was about a 50 50 deal. Now, like uh, one thing that people don't know, you can see these officers individually. Now, that's when they have to go in their pockets, get their friends to contribute to a lawsuit. <coughs> the city gives one dime their party. So that's another way to weed out the bad news. Now, I respect law enforcement. Uh, most of them are good. I'd say a good, uh, good. I'd say safely nine out of ten are good guys. But then they are corrupted by covering up that war, that, uh, that code of silence. And uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I do things discreetly. You know, I, I, I learn you can get more information about them not. Start. I thanks, thank you all for the invitation and it, it awakened that, that 
invited me that I thought, you know, why? This is 2013. Again? <coughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. So, Jerry? Uh, I was wondering, Bill, have you had any reaction uh, from the law enforcement community in Los Angeles to your book that you can talk about? The good cops love it. And there are a number of them. Uh, Las Vegas is a bit of a unique outfit or locale. The, the cops there, the good cops, estimate that 25 to 30 percent Metro Police Force there qualify as rogue or bad cops. Okay. So I fully expect at some point that we're going to hear from some of those guys that are going to try to discredit the book. But so far, all I've heard is positive because they say nobody's been able to expose what really goes on in Las Vegas. And it's not just police. It is this entire cartel. The DA works hand in hand with the cops. There are a number of judges that work hand in hand. You know, one of our lawsuits went nowhere because the judge inserted herself between the arguments of the lawyers and then dismissed the case against Costco. You said, why in the world do they do that? Well, there's some very interesting connections. As an investigative reporter, you find out these things. And without the details there, it's all one huge web. Big money, pays cops to be the enforcers, so you don't have Guido going out and breaking knees and killing people and throwing them in the desert out anymore out there. They're a lot more sophisticated in Vegas than they are back east with that operation. They use the cops to do it. And there's plenty of them that are willing to do it. For money for whatever you want. Because they know they can get away with it, because the system is set up to make sure they get away. Bottom line, there it is. Yes, a number of cops have said, keep it up because this is the only thing we're seeing so far to expose the way it is. Now, how will you know you, you reach success? I think, in my mind, my little old fee brain author mind, is this vision. I see the Las Vegas Strip dead quiet, it's dark at night nothing but sand and tumbleweeds blowing down the strip. That's success. My question is for you as well. Has that cartel web also affected the media so that you don't get the coverage that maybe you get somewhere else, the positive coverage? Let's say yes and no. There are uh, some good reporters out there. <clears throat> Interestingly, most of them have been run out of town. But yeah. Some of them early on very supportive. And after, you know, I did a ton of interviews the first couple of weeks, <coughs> and the cops were on their heels. We've never seen a victim's family come at them like we did. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't just interviews. Some of Eric's friends were just brilliant guys. They're all like this guy. And they came up with ideas like, we're going to get donations and put up billboards. So they did. Electronic billboards are huge in Vegas, you know. So yeah, your your image, your message only comes up every 15 seconds or so. But we had seven of them out there, and we kept changing the message on there. Okay. My other son Kevin lives in Huntington Beach, using donated money that, thank God, came from everywhere, including Skyler. There, uh, <clears throat> we flew a towed banner behind an airplane back and forth, it's mentioned in here, over the World Champion Surfing Championship, the World Surfing Championship. And it says, Vegas Police Cover Up? Question mark, EricBScott.com. Okay, drove them crazy in Vegas. I said, well, why would they do it there? Well, 30% of your customers, Mr. Vegas, comes from Los Angeles area. Yeah. So we hit them where it hurt. And they didn't know what to do about it. So, again, it's all asymmetric war. And hopefully the message keeps churning out there. Uh, to Wayne's point, I asked early on, uh, an ex 
sheriff friend of mine in Colorado. I said, even before I get to Vegas the first time, by that time, you know, I was pretty aware that the cover-up was really underway right then, and I was starting to hear some pretty nasty stuff about the cops out there. So I asked him, I said, do I have to worry about mine and my family's safety out there? They've already killed one of my kids. And he said, stay high profile, and you'll be all right. They won't screw with you. So that's the message to the Peaceful Streets Project, too, I think. Stay high profile, and they're less and less likely to screw with you. Do like this guy does. He's out there in front of the media all the time. But to your point again, the media's control. You know, we went from everything was looking good at the media to we got clobbered overnight. Two things happened on the same day. I, I was writing a blog that was getting 50,000 page views. So people all over the place were, were seeing this. <coughs> and the media were pretty supportive. They were reading it, too. Okay. Overnight, the, our website was crashed. And not only our website, but the entire server that it was on that had other companies' websites on it was crashed. Not Something called an atom bomb. Describe it in here. Still, I don't know if it was a worm or a virus or what, but it crashed the whole thing. And it was a sophisticated attack. This was not some 19-year-old kid in his mom's basement doing this. Metro just happens to have a very sophisticated IT unit. Cyber crimes, joint task force, got the feds in there, everything. So on the same day, all of a sudden, the media broke some really nasty stuff about my son. And of course, it, most of it wasn't true. A dog bite incident and uh, a divorce that he was going through. And it, it was just wicked overnight. So we were rocked back on our heels a bit, but I got a hold of some of the media reporters and I said, this is BS. Unfortunately, his colleague was one of those that loves to go to the cops and get the good story, so he was ingratiating himself. Another reporter, before I even got there, had the goods on the, the sheriff, just as I described in here. Sheriff's got a little dolly in bed, and wife comes home. Okay, shots fired, cops roll in. Oops, it's the boss. Now what do we do? Okay, this reporter had everything there, including the fact that the 911 call in the metro log just disappeared. It went from 2001 to 2003. Number two is gone. I'm sorry about that. Right? This guy was ready to go to press. His editors were behind it. Bam, he's out. He lives in Washington, D.C. now, works there, did not want to talk to me when I called him. So there's a lot of intimidation going on in the press. They walk the fine line. But in uh, November of 11, uh, the Las Vegas Review Journal ran a very courageous five-part series on officers and <coughs> shooters. And those guys did a fantastic job. They ought to get a Pulitzer for it. A lead reporter now works in Florida. Um, this is going to have to be a last question because we're running out of time. This is just a brief question. Are, those, are all of those police officers still employed yes. with Frisco Police? Yes. And how, is, how is it that they were not arrested on the site? Because during the trial, we also uncovered the district attorney was involved with this other group to taint the jury. And I, call, I personally caught wind of it and informed my attorney. And God bless this guy. He set a little trap, and we busted the DA's office working in conjunction to get people on the jury to con convict him. And we prevented that, but we busted on doing that. So the DA, they're in a dilemma, because they wish I would just shut up and go away. But they're in a dilemma, and here's their problem. Because i I, I, I got to be honest, I taunt, I taunt via my, my website and my Facebook. And I'll name names, and I go, and if you don't like it, sue me for slander. I'd love to see you in court, you know what I mean? And I tell them. But they're in a dilemma because they, they got caught red-handed, planning evidence. The DA is another issue that we're looking at as well. Is it, is, they're mad. They're freezing my the attorney I had. He is getting, in his words, BS misdemeanor cases now to deal with. They're freezing him out. Because he exposed them, and he just doesn't care. I mean, he will go after them. And yeah. here's their problem. If they come after me,
and say, well, this guy's just, you know, whatever. He just got lucky and got away with one. Then they're in trouble because they got caught planting evidence and they let a bad guy win. Think about that. They'll get hammered in the press with that. Or they're going to get hammered for planting evidence, like in my case, on an innocent guy. That's what they're, they're, they're in bad shape. So they will not investigate themselves. I caught wind, and I stay out of this town, by the way, because I, just as he was saying, I kid you not, I was walking after the trial. I'm walking out, and I had three Denton County Sheriff's deputies that got to know me during my tenure that said, Chris, be careful. You're going to end up with a bullet in your head. And we're, I don't want to see on the news that they, and I've never done drugs, don't own any guns. But they said, you're going to end up with meth and a bunch of guns and a shootout with the police. And I don't even know what meth looks like. You know what I mean? This is their analogy. So, it's white powder. One of the yeah. things is the unions are incredibly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. The police unions. Absolutely. 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 I personally think if we were to outlaw public employee yeah. unions, a lot of this would go away. But to answer your question, I did hear, I don't know if it's true that Sergeant Sanchez, who uh, he just hates me, could he get rid of me, he would. But I heard that he is working inside only, but I don't know if that happened. But working inside only. Yeah. Writing a test. Yeah. 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 But I don't know if that's entirely true. But I put it out there. All, all those officers should be in jail. Absolutely. And here's a crazy thing, this, and I'll be really brief. CIC run on every cop that came to my house that night, and there was 14 names on this list, and, the, and this included dispatch, uh, the 911 callers and all this. And he got the judge to do a <coughs> bird's eye view or uh, you know look at their personnel records, and then hand over that over to us if it was going to be helpful to us. This guy was a brilliant attorney, and he's a public defender. And you would be shocked out of these 14 cops. There's four. Two DWIs, two assault convictions on cops. And then you add the four that are lying, evidence planning, perjury committing trash. So that's eight out of 14. And then an internal reprimand on another officer who was out with her husband drinking. And he was driving, hit another car. And I'm paraphrasing the situation that she got reprimanded for. She jumps over and gets in the passenger seat to do the whole batch, you know, thin blue line thug line, I call it, and <laughs> citizens, this was back several years ago, citizens said, no, that's not true, he was driving, she gets a little internal 30-day reprimand, you know what I mean, slap on the wrist, so that's a 9 out of 14, and, and I love it that, that you are so optimistic that 9 out of 10 are great, I disagree with you, I think, <laughs> I think if you were a cop, and you know, and you're of another corrupt cop, and you do nothing that makes you a corrupt piece of trash in my book. So, what county is this? This is Denton County, but it's Frisco Police Department. Denton. And that's the little, and I'm up, I'm up against a huge giant. This is a wealthy, the Dallas Cowboys just announced they moved their practice facility. There is a lot, I mean, they are just. What's the name of your blog? What's your website? It's a Facebook page, and I, they shut down one of them. Denied me access to it. So you just Google corrupt Frisco cops, and uh, I'm smart enough technically uh, that I come up in the first two or three lines. You'll see it. Uh, I'm blasting. So anyway. All right, we're, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks a lot. Um, these guys are going to be around uh, for the rest of the day and at the speaker's reception. So if you want to chat with them about their personal stories, that'd be great. I just want to say that it's great when people stand up. I would say for everyone that stands up, there are literally thousands of people who can't for various reasons, financial, uh, legal, um, because no one will listen to them. And so I think it's great when people are victimized who do stand up and share stories. And I think that we should encourage other people to do the same. Thanks a lot. Woo!